the first series program of our summer reading program, and the theme is um, a universe of books. So we're here to have him talk about the moon. What is the first satellite to orbit the Earth? And this is Billy Teets, Dr. Billy Teets from uh, Vanderbilt Dyer Observatory. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming. So, um, how many of you all first have been to the Dyer Observatory? Okay, a couple people have. Uh, so I just want to promote the observatory a little bit because we do have public events. We've got public viewing nights. Uh, we have open houses during the daytime. We have concerts up there. We also have lecture nights, about an hour long lecture and maybe a little viewing afterwards. So I've got some calendars and things up on the table here. Uh, so, you know, please grab as many of those as you want uh, at the end of the program. We've also got summer camps for rising 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. Uh, the 7th and 8th uh, camp, I believe, is full now, but we still have some spots in the 5th and 6th. So if you know someone who, uh, uh, rising 5th and 6th, that is, you know, really interested in science, especially space science and astronomy, um, you know, please let me know. Okay. So we do have uh, applications and camp information up here, okay? All right, so um, as the title suggests, uh, let's talk a little bit about the moon today. So um, we're going to go through quite a few different little things, but I thought let's start off with a little bit of background, some numbers about the moon. So the moon is roughly a quarter of the diameter of the Earth. So if you actually do the math about if you have a quarter of the diameter, what volume is that? It's about a 50th of the volume of our planet, but it only has about 1 80th of the mass of, of the Earth. So when we talk about the, the moon and the Earth orbiting one another, uh, the moon basically does all of the orbiting, but the Earth does move a little bit, and we'll, we'll speak a little bit about that in a bit. Um, but if you have 1 8th of the mass of the Earth crammed into a volume that's 1 50th of the volume of the Earth, then that comes out to about a sixth of the gravity. So uh, on the moon, I'd weigh about 35 pounds. So it'd be really easy to jump, you know, six, seven, eight feet on the moon. So how did the moon form? Well, nobody was around to know exactly how the moon formed, but there is a leading hypothesis known as the giant impact theory. So let's imagine that we go back in time about four and a half billion years the solar system is just finishing up its formation. The planets are basically formed, but as you can see, there's still a lot of little things flying around. When I say little, I mean anything from the size of a grain of sand to maybe a few tens of miles wide, okay? The stuff is still hitting our planet. Here comes another object that astronomers have named Theia. This is a, an object about the size of, the Mars, of Mars, and it's on a collision course for the Earth. It slams into our planet. As you can see, Theia is basically obliterated. And in, the, in this process, not only is it obliterated, but it drags a good bit of the crust of the Earth with it. So this material is blasted off. The core of our planet, uh, which is mostly iron, it's pretty much unscathed, but that material is blasted off. Some of it falls back to the Earth. As you can see it raining down on our planet, but a lot of it stays in orbit and coalesces into the moon that we have today. Okay? So with, astronomers think that this is the leading theory uh, for the formation of the moon because when you look at the composition of our planet, we've got a very uh, dense iron core. The moon, it has a, a pretty small core. It's mostly lighter elements. And if you look at the composition of our moon, it is very, very similar to the composition of the Earth's crust. If you compare our crust to that of, say, Mars, it's significantly different, but the similarity between our moon and the Earth's crust is uncanny, okay? Um, also, since the moon has a very small core, um, and as you saw in that previous simulation, uh, most of just the crust of the Earth was scraped off there, none of our core was really taken with it, it would make sense that whatever formed out here should not have a, a very metallic-y core, okay? Let's talk just a little bit about some of the features that we can see on the moon. Sorry. All right, so what we're going to do in this video is kind of scan from the bottom of the moon around the south pole and slowly go upwards. 
And this is basically what you would be able to see in a small backyard telescope. With the moon being one of the nearest objects to us and pretty bright, it doesn't take a lot to be able to see some of the features. But you'll notice at the bottom of the moon, down around the South Pole, this is a very heavily cratered area. In fact, these very heavily cratered areas are geographically higher in elevation, so they're often referred to as the highlands, as compared to these darker areas, which are pretty smooth. You could kind of refer to these as the lowlands, but they're typically referred to as the maria, which is plural for mare. Um, maria means seas because before uh, the invention of the telescope, folks thought that these were large bodies of water on the moon. Okay? But we now know that these are in fact uh, lava beds that have solidified. Okay? And one thing you'll notice, the maria have very few craters. Okay, here's another one up here, but it's got a few little craters. But when you compare it to, say, the south pole of the moon, it's very, it has a very low count of craters. Okay? So this tells us that the maria are much younger in age than those highland areas. Okay? So there would have been a lot of these, a lot of craters here, but this area um, underwent a violent impact, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment, that erased those craters. Okay? So this area formed later than, say, some of these heavily cratered areas here. In fact, that's the way you date uh, some of the features on the moon is by looking at the number of craters because over time things are constantly hitting the moon. The older they are, the more they've been hit. Okay? Earth has been hit by even more objects than the moon has, but we have things like volcanism, um, earthquakes, erosion, all these processes that really erase all of our craters. There are a few that are really good examples that are still seen, uh, especially from space, but most of ours have been uh, basically completely erased. All right, so how did some of these features form? So now our moon has just formed in orbit around the Earth. It's in the process of cooling, uh, which takes a very, very long time. So we're still about maybe four and a half billion years ago. And then we fast forward to about 4.2 billion years ago. And we have a very large impact occurring on the south pole of the moon. And this forms what's known as the Atkin Basin. So it's one of the, actually it's the largest crater or impact formation in the Earth-Moon system that we can still see records of today. So when you look at um, what are known as topographical maps where you can see the elevation of different features on the moon, the South Pole has a lower area, it's very circular, it's a very large impact, okay? So that's about 4.2 billion years ago. And then we go forward in time just a little bit to about uh, three and a half to four billion years ago, and we are undergoing what's known as the period of late heavy bombardment, where we have these very large objects, we're talking uh, maybe a few tens of miles each, coming in, striking the moon. And we're still early on in the history of the solar system. The interior of the moon is still pretty well molten. Okay? It hasn't had enough time to, to cool and really start to solidify. So when these very large impactors come in and create these enormous craters, the craters are deep enough that they crack completely through the crust of the moon and the, the molten material below flows in and fills up those craters, okay? So I'll let this video play for a, a, a few more seconds here. And we'll talk about what this period of late heavy bombardment is in, in just a moment and why it happened. So these areas start to cool this is where we have the, the darker maria. Okay, so all of those maria are basically very, very large craters that were filled in by magma that then cooled. Okay, so all the craters that were there beforehand were completely obliterated when these impacts occurred. Okay. So over time, they cool, our moon continues to cool. There's still lots of material in our solar system that is flying around impacting objects. But over time, there's less and less of it because the planets are constantly sweeping up that material. So going back from the period of late heavy bombardment to present day, we constantly have objects hitting the moon, hitting us. Um, and so new craters are constantly forming. Okay. And so then we arrive to about today where you can see 
all of those different craters that have, that have impacted. This is actually another very large crater called the Oriental Basin. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, these darker areas, which are very easily seen just with your naked eye, these are uh, the mare, uh, the very large impacts that were filled in by, uh, by magma. So I mentioned earlier this period of late heavy bombardment. So this was early on in the solar system, about three and a half, four billion years ago. This is a simulation known as the Nice model. It's not the NICE model, but the Nice model. It's named after Nice, France, where the group that uh, really worked on this model uh, presented a lot of their results and, and, and worked on it. Um, so what we have here, and the color is making it a little bit harder to see, right at the very center, here is our sun. This is a, a simulation of our solar system early on, just after its initial formation. Um, so we have our sun here. We're not worried about Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. We're worried about the big planets in this simulation. So this first ring right here, this is Jupiter. This yellow one is Saturn. The blue one is Neptune. It's not Uranus like you would normally think. This one is Uranus, okay? If you actually order the planets by mass, um, Neptune is just a little bit more massive than Uranus. And they're also a lot closer together than what you would normally find in the solar system. So what this group did was to try to figure out you know, how did the planets end up the way they are today. So we've got all of our rocky planets close into the sun, like Earth, but then our big gas giant planets are much farther out. Now the first planet found around another star was discovered a little over 20 years ago. Okay? And when we look at our solar system, we would think, okay, the, the biggest planets are probably going to be the easiest to find. So we should find those planets where we find our planets. So our big planets are way out in the solar system, about Jupiter's, for instance, five times farther from the sun than the Earth. So when we look at these other stars and we start finding their big planets, they should probably be way on out there as well. The first large planet ever discovered was found orbiting its star closer than what Mercury orbits our sun, much, much closer in that really kind of turned the astronomy community on its head for a moment because we thought we understood how planets formed. To get these really big guys forming, they have to form far away from the sun where there's a lot of gas and, and dust. But here we're finding the first planet and even the next planets are very, very close into their stars. So it was really a puzzle how those planets could have formed that way. So then it was thought, well, maybe they actually started like our solar system and were way out here and then somehow they migrated inwards. So how would they migrate inwards? Well, the thought was, you know, in a system like ours, we have multiple planets. Maybe the planets were orbiting and tugging on one another, and maybe one was kind of pushing the other in. Or maybe all of this debris, all these little objects called Kuiper Belt objects, which are things like Pluto, uh, these smaller objects, maybe there were a tremendous amount of those that the planets interacted with, and started spiraling in. So the astronomers that came up with the Nice model, that's what they tried to replicate. They tried to set up this original scenario and see if gravity could cause the planets to shift positions. Okay, so let's, let's run this simulation. So we're gonna, so time equals zero, that's about four and a half billion years ago, okay? And then as time is progressing, we're getting closer and closer to um, present day. So all the planets are pretty much evenly spaced, which they are not in our current solar system. And then we have all these leftover remains of our solar system's formation. So we're letting time run. Now one thing I want you to note, we're not just letting these dots just kind of appear all over the place. The computer is saying each one of these little dots, and there are thousands of them, each one of them has a mass. How do they tug on each of their neighbors? You have to do all the computations. So this is not something that a computer like this would be able to run. These are supercomputer simulations. So they're letting them run to see how they're interacting with one another and interacting with the planets. Now what is happening, you can't really see it here, is that Saturn is very, very gradually moving in towards Jupiter, okay? Now, when we get to the time equals 800 and about 50 million years, 
you see something really interesting happen. We're going to slow it down. Okay. Now, a couple of things happened here. First off, you'll notice, well, all of our little particles, all of our little Kuiper Belt objects, things the size of Pluto and smaller, they're, they've been thrown everywhere. Okay? You'll notice that, well, it's kind of hard to see with the color, but this was, this is Neptune. Neptune was closer than what Uranus was. They have actually switched places. Okay? So what happened, Saturn got to a point where it was close enough into the Sun that it reached what we call a resonance with Jupiter. So every time Saturn made one orbit around the Sun, Jupiter made exactly two. Okay, so every time, let's say Saturn got right here, Jupiter was always there pulling on it. So that caused the, the orbits, instead of being really nice and circu circular like this, it caused them to get really distorted for a minute. And when Saturn started getting kind of whipped way out here, it had a gravitational influence on Uranus and Neptune and caused their orbits to get really distorted. So when these guys moved way on out, well, they're much more massive than any of these little particles. They really created a lot of havoc in our solar system. And so that threw a bunch of those little objects way on out, but it also threw a lot of them towards the inner part of the solar system where we are. Okay? And so happening about uh, three and a half to four billion years ago, when all of those particles were thrown into our inner solar system, some of them hit the moon to create the Maria. Okay? Now, these impacts, like I said, they are still happening today. So this was taken with the Midas telescope. Watch down here. We'll replay it a couple of times. So this telescope, which stands for uh, the Moon Impacts Detection and Analysis System, this telescope is constantly watching the moon when it can, and it's looking for things to hit. And every now and then it catches something hitting the moon. Uh, believe it or not, there's about 100 tons of material that comes into the Earth every day from space. Uh, most of that is going to be really small objects, like grains of sand size, but you have some bigger objects. The thing that we see hitting here is thought to have had a diameter of about two to four feet, something like this. Okay, so I'll play the movie again. Now we slowed down the video, but again, watch down here. That was, one of, that was actually the brightest impact that this system had ever recorded. If you were standing on the Earth looking up at the moon when that happened, you would have actually been able to see a, a, a faint glimmer of light from that impact. Okay? So that roughly two to four foot wide object hit the, the moon at about 40,000 miles per hour. And it created a crater about 100 feet wide. So here's a before and an after. These images are from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is in orbit around the moon, taking images, uh, getting very high resolution views uh, for mapping purposes. But we have our before and then our after. Okay. Now one thing you'll notice is that there's a bunch of, of streaks going out in all directions. Those are called rays. That is the material that was blasted out of that crater. So it's blasted out, then it fell back to the moon. Okay. There's a really good example of a large rayed crater called Tycho. That's it right there. Okay. You can actually see it with the naked eye, but a telescope shows a really nice view of it. But you can see these streaks coming out away from it. In fact, you can even see streaks coming out of this one as well. So that's just ejecta. That's material that was blown out when this crater was created. But Tycho is a really fun crater to look at. It's got a lot of interesting features. Now, this is an overview from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, we can't see it quite overhead like that, but almost. So it's got a very nice circular uh, rim to it. So from the edge of the rim down to the floor, so if we were to draw a straight line or, or figure out how deep this crater is, it's about three miles deep. Now it's deceptively large. In the telescope, you can make out the central mountain here. But if we put this here on the Earth, if uh, Nashville was right here, Clarksville would be about right here. So this is almost 60 miles wide. 
Okay, but again, in the telescope, it looks very, very small. Now, the central mountain, some craters have these very nice mountains, and you would think that they'd have a nice, smooth bottom to them, but the mountains come about as a result of how these craters are created. So if you've got something really large coming in and hitting the, the moon, uh, when it hits, a lot of energy is directed down into the ground and compresses that material, and then it quickly rebounds. And so that energy, that rebound energy, will often heave up a lot of material right in the very center to create these mountains. You can kind of think of, um, if you think of those um, videos of a drop of water in slow motion, you drop a little pebble in the water, it creates a little crater shape, and then all of a sudden this drop comes up from the center. Basically about the same thing here. Okay. But now let's zoom in just a little bit on this mountain. So here's the central peak from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, this is a couple miles tall. Let's zoom in to this area right here. Okay. So this is the very top of that mountain. And what's really nice about the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is it has really, really good imagery of the moon. You can see very fine details. But sometimes it's hard to figure out, unless you do some measurements, you know, just how big are these things that we're looking at here. Um, what caught uh, a lot of astronomers' eyes was this one boulder just kind of sitting there. And it's thought that when the crater formed about 100 million years ago and the, the floor kind of rebounded to create that mountain, this boulder was actually heaved up, went flying up into the, the lunar sky, and then fell right back down on that mountain. Okay? But again, how big is that mountain? Here's a comparison. There's Titan Stadium. So it would easily fill the stadium. Uh, the, the, uh, the entire mountain was about two to three miles high, but then the boulder um, is a little over 100 meters wide. So, it, it, um, you know, with the, the, um, the field here would be a little bit more than 100 meters. Uh, yeah, it's so not quite as tall as Everest, but yeah, I guess it would be about as high as one of the Rockies. I, I forget the, the maximum altitude of the Rockies. So yeah, about two miles. So yeah, it'd be comparable to the Rockies, yeah. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the, the orbit of the moon and some other things. So we have over here an Earth. Let's turn on our Earth. I can see it a little bit better. Now, if our Earth there is 16 inches in diameter. So how big would our moon be compared to that Earth? I kind of gave away the answer on the first slide, I think. Anybody remember? So here's our moon, same scale. All right, so they are scaled correctly in size, roughly. How far would the moon be away from the Earth? Anybody want to guess? I mean, you're welcome to also come up and stand where you think it would be. Let's say we, we draw a line between here and that door. Where would I have to put this moon in order to get it at the right distance? About where the other moon is? Okay, let me hang this guy here. All right. There we go. All right. Hopefully he won't fall. So you think about right there? Anybody else agree or disagree? Hopefully he won't fall. Sound good to anybody? All right. You're a little bit close in. I'll move. What do you think? into this table, yeah. this table right here, so about right here? Uh, right there, okay. All right, look good to anybody? All right, we're actually about halfway there. So I measured it out. It would actually go at this scale, it would have to be about 40 feet away from the Earth over there, okay? So that's a, a pretty good scaling right there. Here it is on the, the screen. 
So our Earth is scaled correctly to our moon and our distances are scaled correctly. So on average, the moon's about 385,000 miles or kilometers from us, um, about 235,000 miles. Um, and this is a neat little simulation. So let's imagine we could send a, a pulse of light from the Earth and we're standing out in space or floating out in space and we're watching that pulse of light and it's hitting a mirror on the moon and coming back hitting a mirror on the Earth. That's how fast the light would actually be traveling in between the Earth and the moon. So as you look at the moon in the night sky, you're not seeing it as it is right now. You're seeing it as it was about 1.2 seconds ago. Okay? So if something struck the moon right now, you wouldn't see it for another 1.2 seconds. Like right now, you're watching up on the screen or you're looking at me, you're seeing me as I was about five billionths of a second ago. Okay? That's how long it takes the light to get from me to you. All right? Now our moon is not in a circular orbit, it's in what we call an elliptical orbit. So um, instead of being a perfect circle, it's like you take the circle and you kind of squish it just a little bit. Okay? And the Earth is not at the very center of that circle, we're off to the side just a, a little bit. Which means that at certain times the moon is closer to the Earth, it can be anywhere from 363,000 kilometers from us, or at certain times it could be really far away as far as 400,000 kilometers from us, okay? So since it changes its distance from us, it will change its apparent size as well. So you've probably heard of a supermoon before. They have really seemed to gain popularity in the past few years uh, thanks to social media. So when the moon is at full moon and it is near its closest point to the Earth, at perigee point, then uh, we call it a supermoon. So it's a little bit bigger in our sky. You wouldn't be able to tell that with your eye unless somebody told you, or you had very good measuring capabilities. Um, and being closer, it's usually a little bit brighter as well. And then when it's at full moon, but it's farthest away from us, we call it a micromoon. Okay, so it's a little bit fainter. But again, you wouldn't be able to tell it without somebody letting you know that. Okay? So normally, its size in the sky is about halfway in between those two. All right. So how does the moon orbit? I've got a little simulation I want to show you. Oh, perfect. Um, except I can't see it on my screen now. Uh, let me drag this back here. Okay, there we go. So I mentioned earlier how uh, the moon is basically doing all of the orbiting here. So this little simulation is showing our sun here in yellow. And the little cross is what we call the center of mass. So let's imagine that the sun doesn't have any planets orbiting around it. It's just the sun. Okay? Its center of mass is right in its very center. Now let's add a planet. Let's add the planet Mercury. Okay. And I'm going to run our simulation. Okay. Now you're not really seeing anything happening. But Mercury, we're imagining that Mercury is going around the sun. We're looking at the effect of Mercury on our sun. We don't see anything. In fact, I'm going to add some more planets. Let's do Venus, Earth, and Mars. Still don't really see anything happening. Now let's add Jupiter, our most massive planet. There we are. So now Jupiter, it's about a thousand times less massive than the sun, okay? But imagine that we had a rod connecting the center of the sun to the center of Jupiter. And I want to balance the sun-Jupiter system on that rod. Because Jupiter it has a significant mass, if I put the rod right below the sun, Jupiter's going to pull the whole rod system down. Okay, so I've got to find a point along that rod to balance that so that the mass of the sun is balancing the much farther away mass of Jupiter. Okay? So that's what we're doing here. That balancing point is the center of mass. So when we have Jupiter there, Jupiter has enough mass that as it's orbiting the sun, it's actually causing the sun to move around a little bit. Okay? So in this simulation, 
it's taking the sun about 12 years, which is how long it takes Jupiter to orbit. It's taking about 12 years to make one wobble around. Okay. Now Saturn is about a third of the mass of Jupiter. Let's add Saturn in as well. Okay, so we're resetting. Notice that the sun is not always the same distance from that center of mass. It's kind of doing like a spiral graph pattern here. So if we just had Saturn up there, it would pull on the sun as well, not quite as much as Jupiter. But now when we have both Jupiter and Saturn moving around at different rates, sometimes they're on the same side of the sun, so they both pull on the sun, and that really makes the sun get far away from the center of mass. And then at other times, Jupiter's on one side of the sun, Saturn's on the other side, okay? And so they kind of cancel out each other. And so then the sun gets closer into the center of the mass like it is now, all right? Now the reason I'm showing you this is that our sun, or excuse me, our Earth and Moon do the same thing. Now if you remember, the Moon is about uh, 80 times less massive than our sun, or than our Earth. So when you look at where we would have to balance the Earth-Moon system on that imaginary rod that connects them, that point is actually about 700 miles below my feet. Okay, so it's almost in the center of the Earth here, but not quite. So as the, Earth, as the Moon is orbiting around, Earth is actually making a wobble as well. Okay? I want to give you another example here. Um, let me switch back over. So here are Pluto and Charon. So Charon is the largest moon of Pluto. But you see, it's a pretty sizable moon compared to Pluto itself. Okay? Now, this movie, which I'll show you in just a second, was taken from the New Horizons mission, which was uh, a mission that would fly by Pluto and take images as it went and would give us our first up-close views of, of the system. Okay? So this was back in 2015. These images were taken when Pluto was still 90 days away from New Horizons. Okay? But we could start to see the, uh, Pluto and its largest moon, Charon. And we could watch them actually orbit around one another. So let me uh, start this. Well, here we go. So here you can really see how those two objects, or, or you can really see how Charon is not just going around Pluto, they're both orbiting around the center of mass right in there. Okay, So if Pluto is five times closer to the center of mass than Charon, that means Pluto's five times as massive. Okay. So again, our moon does the exact same thing. All right, so we have what we call the near side of the moon. This is the side of the moon that we can see from the Earth. Um, a lot of people refer to the other side of the moon as the dark side. And the moon actually has no dark side. It has a far side to it. All right? So from the Earth, we can only see that one side of the moon. Now, let's figure out why that is. So if we were looking, so if we were up above the Earth, looking down on our Earth and our moon, would we see the moon rotating on its axis as it goes around the Earth? I mean, we see the same side of the moon all the time, so what do y'all think? Believe it or not, the moon does rotate. So here's that scenario. We have, we're looking at the Earth from above, and we've got our moon orbiting around much closer than what it actually orbits but we don't have our moon rotating. You can see the, the near side, which I've shaded in red, is always pointing towards the left side of the screen over here. So when the moon is on this side of its orbit, the near side faces us, but when it's on this side, we can't see the near side. So that means the moon has to rotate. So let's get it rotating. Oh, you have a question? Well, I mean, you would kind of see, well, yeah, you kind of see phases there, but the phase really depends on where the sun is. Okay. So let's add in the rotation. So we've added some rotation. 
but we don't have the rotation right. Sometimes that near side is facing us and other times it's not. But let's get it so that for every rotation around the Earth, the moon rotates once on its axis. And that's in fact what happens. That's known as a tidal lock. So the gravity of the Earth has actually slowed the rotation of the moon so that it will complete one rotation on its axis for every orbit it makes around the Earth. So that way it keeps that same side facing us. There are a number of moons in the solar system that do the exact same thing. Uh, Saturn has some examples, Jupiter has some examples. So again, we have our near side, which we can see from the Earth, and there is a far side, okay? So the far side has been imaged a number of times. The, the first time it was ever seen uh, was with the Luna, I think it was Luna 7 probe from uh, the uh, uh, Soviet Union. I guess it was the Soviet Union at the time. But um, we don't get to see it from the Earth, but there have been 24 people that have seen the far side with their own eyes, okay? So those were astronauts in the Apollo programs. There were nine Apollo missions that actually orbited around the moon uh, during the mission. So you would think there'd be 27 people that saw it, but three of those people made two trips, okay? Now, even though we can only see 50% of the moon at one time, or half of the moon at one time, given enough time, you can actually see a total of 59% of the entire lunar surface from the Earth. So this is so, something known as lunar libration, where you have, uh, you notice that the moon is kind of doing this wobbling motion. You also notice that it's getting larger and smaller. So if you recall, it's in an orbit that brings it closer and farther away from the Earth. So when it's larger, it's closer. When it's farther away, it's smaller. And we just talked about how the moon rotates once on its axis for every orbit around the Earth. Now the moon's rotation rate, how long it takes to rotate on its axis stays the same, but its speed around the Earth constantly changes because it's constantly changing distance. That's Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So when the moon is fast or moving, or when the moon is closer to us, it's actually orbiting faster, okay? And so when it orbits faster, it's moving a little bit too fast for the rotation rate to keep up so that it always keeps that one side facing us. And so if you watch the moon, it starts to turn just a little bit. But then when it gets to the other side of the orbit, it's farther away, so it's slowing down. And so now it's moving a little too slow for the rotation to keep in sync. So it rotates the opposite way. And so that's what's causing that wobble back and forth. Okay? But at any one time, you only see 50% but given enough time due to this wobbling or this libration, then you can see the uh, up to 59%. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me move forward just a couple of steps here. One thing I want to point out about phases, one of the biggest misconceptions in astronomy, and I get this in my astronomy classes all the time, is that phases are caused by the shadow of the Earth. Phases have nothing to do with the Earth's shadow. Okay? So here we have our sun, and let's imagine we're looking down from above on the Earth and the moon at its different positions in its orbit. So this is where it is in its orbit, and here are the corresponding phases that we see, okay? So when the moon is almost in between the sun and the Earth, then we see the near side in complete darkness. So the far side is facing the sun. So you notice that it's illuminated. The far side is illuminated which again, a lot of people call this the dark side. Well, during new moon, the dark side is actually completely lit up. So there is no dark side, all right? But you would think, okay, if this is new moon and the moon's completely darkened, then that must mean the shadow of the earth is completely covering it. Well, if the sun's here, earth is here, our shadow is cast back this way. There's no way it can be cast towards the moon to create the new moon. So half of the moon is always lit up by the sun, okay? Whatever half is facing the sun. And as the moon is orbiting around the earth, we see different bits of that lit half, okay? So when it's at full moon, 
then the lit half is facing us and we see that entire lit half. When we're at first quarter, half of the lit half is facing the, or, um, is facing the earth here. And so we only see um, half of the moon in the sky, same thing for third quarter. So again, the shadows have nothing to do with phases. There are a couple of illusions. You've probably seen the moon rising when you've got a good clear horizon and it's got kind of this deep red color, but it also looks enormous and you would, you know, you would swear that it's like three times its original size. But that's actually just an illusion, okay? It's not well understood why the moon looks so large. If you actually measure it, it's not larger. But it's often thought that when the moon is near the horizon, there are things like trees and buildings that you can kind of compare it to and get, and your brain is trying to gauge a size based on that comparison. So in this view here, we've got a moon up here and a moon down here. And when you first glance at that, you would think that this moon is actually a little bit larger. But in reality, they are exactly the same size. There are different features on here, like these uh, train tracks that are converging that can kind of skew your perspective and make you and kind of trick you into thinking that one is larger than the other. But it is actually correct because when I had the computer screen, I took a ruler and measured just to make sure that I wasn't crazy. So it is just an illusion. There's another little applet I want to show you. Um, so when the moon is near the horizon and it looks so large, Believe it or not, it actually appears a bit smaller than when it's high up in the sky. Okay? So in this simulation, we've got the sun off to the left side. We've got the earth here. We've got somebody standing there kind of representing where we are. We've got our moon here. Okay? Over here, this is the phase that this little guy is seeing based on where the moon is and the sun being over here. Now let's imagine that we go to our full moon. So now, the moon is on the opposite side of the Earth. Let's rotate the Earth around. Okay. All right. So now, and by the way, this little applet down here at the bottom, that's kind of showing you the little guy standing there. Here's the green grass. Here's where the moon's just rising. Here's where the moon's just setting. So he's looking over at that moon, and he's thinking, oh, that's a humongous moon. Now the distance between him and the moon is this distance here, okay? So this is when he's seeing the moon when it looks really, really large, when it's just at the horizon. Now let's rotate the earth around so that the moon rises up in the night sky for him, okay? So here we are, and if you watch, here's the, the moon rising up here. We're gonna get it up high in the sky All right, so that's when the moon is almost directly overhead, and that's when it looks really small in the sky. But now, look at the distance between us and the moon. We were way over here, and that was our distance. But now when the moon looks smaller, we're actually closer to it. We're about 4,000 miles closer to it because the Earth has rotated us around. So when the moon is up high in the sky, it actually is a little bit bigger than when it's at the, the horizon. Okay. There's another effect. Oops, hold on a second here. There's one more effect. So because our atmosphere has different layers of different densities, when we're looking through a lot of atmosphere, the moon appears squashed to us. So these are three different images taken from the International Space Station. As they were coming around the Earth, they were watching the moon appear to rise. And you notice when it's really way down here in the atmosphere, so this glowing is our atmosphere, it looks really squashed. But as it gets up higher and higher and gets away from most of the atmosphere, it becomes more rounded. So it may look the same width, but when the, the moon is lower, it's actually a little bit more squashed because of the atmosphere. Um, since we're running low on time, I just want to show you a couple of other things and then we'll, we'll move on here. Uh, okay, so the last thing I wanted to mention was tides. So I think most of us have probably encountered tides. So around the Bay of Fundy, 
up in uh, northeastern Canada. This is where they have some of the highest and lowest tides um, because of the, the topography of the region, the way the water kind of gets funneled in and out. So tides are a result not only of the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, but more specifically how the, the part of the earth that is nearest the sun and the moon gets pulled on stronger than the opposite side of the earth, okay? So let's do a little example here. So imagine that we have, uh, let's say this is the sun, and we have three balls just kind of setting out in space. We just set them out where they're evenly spaced. The sun has gravity. The sun is going to be trying to pull these balls in towards it, okay? Here's where they are when we start our timer, okay? A little bit time, uh, a little bit time later, um, because this ball is closer to the sun than the green one, it gets pulled harder. So it gets pulled farther away uh, from its original starting point than what the green one is. Okay? The red one is the farthest, so it doesn't, get really, it doesn't really get pulled at all. So if you watch these balls over time, they get pulled farther and farther and farther apart from one another. Now how does this play into the Earth? Well, let's imagine that the blue ball represents the, the part of the ocean, which is this blue ring that's surrounding the Earth. Let's imagine that's this part of the ocean. The green ball is this part of the Earth, and the red ball is this part of the ocean over here. We do the exact same thing, let the gravity of the sun pull on us. Because this part of the ocean is closer to the sun, it gets pulled harder. The Earth gets pulled somewhat, and then the red part over here gets pulled very little. And so from our viewpoint, you would think that if the sun is over here, that we'd get a bulge of water right over here. But in fact, we get two bulges of water, okay? And the second bulge over here, it, you know, kind of mystified folks at first. But what's happening is, it's not like this, the sun is pushing this water out. It's essentially pulling the earth away from the water, okay? So if you were standing in, that, in Africa right here watching, if you didn't know that you were moving, you would think, oh, this blue area here is getting pulled away from me, but now the red area is moving away from me as well, when actually it's you moving away from the red area, okay? So um, again, the, this, we get these tidal bulges because the distance between uh, the sun and, and the earth is what really makes the difference here, okay? So if the sun pulled equally on all of these different areas, then we wouldn't have those tides, okay? So we have things called spring tides and neap tides. Let me give you an example of what those are. All right. All right. So here we have just our moon, okay? We have, here's the first tidal bulge here, here's our Earth, and here's the second tidal bulge. Now let's run the simulation. So as the Earth is rotating, Moon's orbiting around, notice that the tidal bulges are always pointing towards the Moon. Makes sense, right? All right, now, let's, I'm gonna let this run to where we're at full Moon. So the, the, the Sun is gonna be over here off the screen, okay? All right, so I'm gonna pause that. Now I'm going to include the gravity of the sun, okay? So now the sun is pulling on the water, the moon is pulling on the water, so we get extra high tides. So this occurs at full moon, so the moon's over here, sun's over here, and it will also occur at new moon, when they're both pulling in the same direction. So those extra high tides are called spring tides. They have nothing to do with the season. It's just that the water kind of, I guess you could say, just kind of springs up higher than normal. Because these spring tides, they occur all year, okay? Now, um, so we have our sun over here, moon down here. The moon's trying to pull the water this way and, and make a bulge this way. The sun's trying to do the opposite and do it this way so they cancel each other out a little bit, okay? So let me turn off our sun. 
So there's the bulge just from the moon, but now if I add the sun back in, notice how it cancels out those tides a little bit. Those are called the neap tides. Those are the, the, the lower high tides, okay? One final thing, so I'm gonna run this simulation. Let's include the effects of the Earth's rotation. Okay. Now if you watch, now those tidal bulges aren't pointing right at the moon. They're actually pointing up in front of the moon because the, the friction from the Earth rotating under is dragging that tidal bulge around. So you would think normally that you would have high tide when the moon is highest up in the sky. But in reality, we get a high tide maybe about an hour before the moon gets highest up in the sky. Okay. All right, and then one final slide here and then we will take questions. So like I said, tides are uh, present throughout the solar system. So Io is the most volcanically active body in the entire solar system. One of the largest moons of Jupiter. It's the closest in of its large moons. Jupiter is about 300 times as massive as the Earth, so its gravitational tug on this moon is extreme. So as Io is orbiting around Jupiter, it's constantly getting pulled and, and, and squished and tugged by Jupiter's gravity and also the other moons of, of Jupiter. So that creates so much friction inside of this moon that it keeps the interior of that moon molten. This is a view from the New Horizons craft when it arrived at Jupiter. It went into orbit around Jupiter to gain speed to then go on to, to Pluto. But while it was there, it got images of this uh, volcano called Tvashtar erupting on Io. So this moon is a little bit larger than our own moon. Okay? This plume of material is about 200 miles high. Okay? In fact, all of these little spots here, those are all volcanoes on, on Io, okay? Now, we, we can easily see how the, the, the moon and the sun's gravity pull on the water of the Earth and cause it to bulge up. Well, the same thing happens to the land of the Earth, except because the land is solid, the bulge from the land is very subtle. It's only about eight inches for the Earth. But Jupiter and the other moon's immense gravitational tug on this moon actually causes the land on Io to rise about 300 feet. So it's got extreme tides, okay? A final thing about our moon, as a result of the moon tugging on the Earth constantly, it's gradually slowing us down, uh, which means that we're losing rotational energy that energy has to go somewhere and it goes to the moon and actually causes the moon to spiral out by about two inches per year, okay? And so these little retro reflectors which were placed on the moon during the Apollo mission, from the Earth we can fire a very powerful laser at the moon and when it hits those reflectors, it'll reflect the beam right back to us, okay? And we can time very, very precisely how long it takes the moon to travel from the Earth to the moon and back and from that time get a distance. And it has been confirmed that the moon is very gradually spiraling away from us, okay? So, um, and you know, I forget how many millions of years the moon will be too far away to be able to create a total solar eclipse anymore, okay? Speaking of eclipses, if you missed the 2017 eclipse, there is another total solar eclipse coming through the U.S. in 2024. So we're right here. So we're only about an hour and a half, two hour drive from totality. But if you happen to be in the path of totality for this one, especially like right in here, you'll see a total eclipse for about four minutes, okay? So mark that on your calendar, a little less than five years. And with that, um, I think we'll end. Does anybody have any questions about anything we've spoken about? You had mentioned uh, Bay of Hunting. Yes. It's where the, the tidal change is really, really extreme um, because of the, the topography of the land really influences it, kind of helps funnel things in uh, to make the tides appear much, much higher. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how the um, moon is slowly getting away from the Earth. Can yes. Get to a point where it leaves our orbit? It won't leave our orbit. So as we are, uh, as it's gradually spiraling out, and we're in the same process of slowing down. 
Um, so we're slowing down by about, uh, it's less than a second a century, you know, which may not seem like much, but given enough time, uh, we will slow down enough so that, um, here's my little moon here. You know, so right now the moon is, you know, it, oops, it's always keeping its face towards us, you know, but we're constantly rotating faster, so, you know, the whole Earth seizes. But as it gets farther away and it's slowing us down, eventually it'll be far enough out and we'll be moving slow enough that um, the Earth's rotational rate will match the orbital period of the moon. So eventually we will just constantly be facing one another. So if you're on one side of the Earth, you will see the moon in essentially the same part of the sky all the time. Um, and if you're on the other side of the Earth, you never get to see the moon. So at that point, the moon should stop spiraling away from us. But that's predicted to be about 40 to 50 billion years from now, and the sun will, will run out of fuel in about 5 billion, so we won't ever get to that point. Yeah? Um, how, how far in the solar system is the moon away from the Earth? How far in the solar system is the moon from yeah, the Earth? Uh huh. So I'll like compared to the rest of the solar system, you mean? So um, if we imagine that, uh, let's say our sun was about an eight-inch ball, so a little bit bigger than this, okay, and we had it over at that door, the Earth would be the size of a little seed, and it would be over about that door, and at that scale, the moon would be about that far from us. So we're really, really it. You know, even though it's 240,000 miles from us, took us three days to get there in a, in a rocket, um, it's still really close compared to the rest of the solar system. Okay. All right. And while we're talking about scales, the next nearest star to our sun, um, it would be about 3,000 miles from us. So, space is big. That's why it's called space. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all for coming today. And um, again, we've got camp applications. We've got um, event calendars for the observatory, as well as just a uh, celestial event calendar, different things that are happening in the sky. So you guys are welcome to come pick those up. Question. Yes. I keep trying to convince my husband to go out and on one of your uh, what, sky watching nights. Yes. And he always says, oh, it's, it's, it's uh, cloudy. You know, the clouds came in. Yeah. And so what do you do? Um, we have a lot of volunteers and staff stationed around the observatory at our different exhibits. Um, in fact, there are two volunteers that bring their own very elaborate exhibits that are you know, on eight-foot tables. So um, as folks are going around to the different displays and uh, volunteers and whatnot, we're talking to them about what the displays are showing, what the exhibits are, are showing, answer questions and things like that. And so we'll often also do demonstrations. Um, like I have a, a little um, orrery, which is a model of the solar system, and so you can talk about how things move in the solar system. So people still have a, a great time. I mean, we get a lot of great comments on those nights, even when it's clouded out. And we still have a lot of people come. And they bring their own um, telescopes? Uh, we don't bring your own telescopes, um, especially on the clear nights, because um, everybody is, you know, has got their own duty that we've got to do. And we have our own telescopes up there uh, for people to view through, but we just don't have enough time uh, to be able to, you know, sit down with somebody and, and show them how to operate a telescope or figure out what's wrong with their telescope. Uh, we often recommend uh, contacting one of the uh, local astronomy clubs that have uh, viewing nights where the, all the members go out and they set up public viewing events, and that's really a good way to learn about how a telescope works because they'll have their setup and they can kind of show you the the basics of it. So it. Learning how the sky moves and how to use a telescope properly is not like a you know a thirty minute crash course. So it, it really just takes some um, uh, experience of your own, but they can at least show you the, the basics of it. Okay. But you're looking out of the if you go up there, you're looking out of the observatory. Oh, the it lasted. Stories? Yes. Uh, so we have the twenty four inch telescope. We've got um, on a Let's see, I think we've had seven telescopes going at one time. Really depends on what objects are visible. Um, if we've got a lot of objects up, especially if the moon's not up, then that allows us to see some of the fainter things. Um, also depends just kind of on the sky conditions. If it's, 
even if it's a dark night but it's kind of hazy, you're not going to be able to see the faint stuff. And also depends on how many volunteers and staff we have. So uh, we try to do as much as we can, but uh, we, we always have a lot of fun regardless of what happens. So. All right. Well, thank you all again. And